My dear friends in Christ, I'd like to talk to you briefly this morning about knowledge of Mary. In order that we may imitate someone, we have to know something about them. And of course, the more we know, the better we can imitate them. In order to love someone, we must know them. And these are really our two great motives for knowing our Blessed Mother. That we might love her and that we might imitate her. Now, of course, 45 minutes is not sufficient time to acquaint ourselves with the mother of pure love. In fact, a whole lifetime would not be close to sufficient time to get to know her sufficiently. But luckily for us, by perseverance and God's grace, we will have eternity to get to know her. But St. Louis Marie de Montfort, most particularly in his book, True Devotion to Mary, gives this advice with a holy vehemence. There is fire in his words. We, we feel the ardor of his heart. He tells us. He wants the whole world to know. He wants us to hear it. He wants us to heed it. Know Mary. Love Mary. Imitate Mary. Mary. If we do this, she will bring us to Christ. So when we want to get to know someone, we start to find out little details about their lives, such as what are their likes and dislikes? What is it that motivates them? What do they do in their spare time? And when thinking of our Blessed Mother, we may be tempted to say, well, if I speak to Mary, how is she going to answer me? I'm not going to hear words. I won't know in a way that I understand. How can I get these little details? It's impossible. But my dear friends, nothing could be more wrong than saying this. It has been God's pleasure to reveal to us his Holy Mother. He has given us mountains of details about her, in fact, that we might know his greatest creation, his most exquisite work. He puts her up on a pedestal above all the angels and saints that she might magnify the dazzling light of her Son that we might be able to see. Behold my mother. Behold thy mother. But we can know Mary. We can know her more fully, in fact, than we know our closest loved ones. What is in Scripture is fairly brief but it is replete with meaning. We can learn so very much from the Annunciation, the visitation to St. Elizabeth, the wedding feast of Cana, Mary standing beneath the cross of her son. And over the centuries, since her earthly life, she has come to us repeatedly. She has given us so many little details through her saints, through her visionaries, that have helped us to know her, to know what it is that she loves. What are her goals? What are her desires for us? 
the saints, the fathers of the church, have given us a treasure trove of information about our mother. But what is even more than all of this information that has been passed down to us from tradition, either written or spoken, what is even more is that if a soul truly wants to know Mary, if a person is really striving to know her, that Christ will, in every way possible, help us. He will give us the grace. He will illumine our minds that we might know his mother. Because it is his will that we should come to him through her. We will see if we really pursue this knowledge of Mary, that our knowledge of Mary and advancement and holiness is going to be in direct proportion. Since we cannot know her without loving her. And since we cannot love her without loving her son. But what do we know about Mary? At least what can we say today in this short period of 45 minutes we might ask some of those questions we have already asked other questions we might ask any other person what are Mary's interests and we know the simple answer the simple answer her only interest is God this can be the answer for every question we ask of her, in fact. What does she like? What God likes. What does she dislike? What God dislikes. What, motiva what motivates her? Love of God. What does she do in her spare time? She loves God. And although these answers to these questions are very true, we might make the mistake of thinking of Our Lady as some sort of ethereal being, more fantastic than real, more spirit-like in her aloofness. But this is so far from the truth. Our mother is a woman and a mother, and she has a very human heart that she uses to love her creator with all of its strength. But it is, again, the advice of St. Louis de Montfort that we begin learning of Mary and her interests by studying, by considering the virtues which she practiced. And this, this makes absolute sense because we... We know that a person proves themselves more by what they do than by what they say. The very words of our Lord, by their fruits you shall know them. So if we study the fruits of our blessed mother, her actions, I think we might get to know her a little better. St. Alphonsus and St. Louis give ten chief virtues. And of course Mary is the perfect model in every possible virtue. She is full of grace. She could not possibly practice any virtue more perfectly. In the Canticle of Canticles we hear the title All Fair. But we will take each of these ten virtues very briefly and consider them Think of how our Blessed Mother practiced these virtues. How might they apply to us? The first virtue that St. Alphonsus and St. Louis Marie de Montfort choose is the virtue of humility. Since humility is the foundation of every virtue. And if we are not careful 
we might be led into some confusion. Because, after all, isn't humility simply the humble, the, the acknowledgement of our relationship with Almighty God? And the bishop, in his talk yesterday, covered this briefly. We certainly have cause for humility. We who are sinners, we deserve the wrath of Almighty God, and we can consider ourselves as worms, as nothing, compared to His Majesty. But what about the Blessed Mother? From her conception, she was perfect. God had elevated her above every creature. He loved her with a singular love and showed it by endowing her with every possible grace. So what cause does she have for humility? She knew that without God, she was nothing. She did not even exist without Almighty God. St. Bernardine of Siena said that the Blessed Virgin had always the majesty of God and her own nothingness present in her mind. And he continues, After the Son of God, no creature in the world was so exalted as Mary because no creature in the world ever humbled itself so much as she did. St. Alphonsus explains in his book, The Glories of Mary, we can think of it like a beggar who receives a, a very costly garment from a wealthy benefactor. This garment might be an occasion of pride and joy, but Would this beggar brag in the presence of his donor? Certainly not. And even further, this costly garment would be a sharp reminder to the beggar that he is poor. That without the charity of his benefactor, he would not even have this. And so it was that our Blessed Mother thought of herself. She attributed nothing to herself, but gave all to the glory of God. She told St. Elizabeth of Hungary one day, Rest assured that I look upon myself as most vile and unworthy of God's grace. Perhaps we ought to look at ourselves. Can we say even for a moment that we are humble? Most likely not. But if we know of Mary's humility, if we have before our mind's eye this august queen, mistress of the universe, humbling herself, making herself as nothing, how could we, wretched as we are, foster pride in ourselves? By knowing Mary's humility, we can ourselves start to practice it. The next virtue that we might consider is the greatest of all the virtues, charity. First, Mary's charity toward God, her love of Almighty God, and next, her charity toward her fellow man. Just this last Sunday, Holy Mother Church gave us for our consideration, for our spiritual food, the account in the Gospel of St. Matthew, when our Lord was confronted by a Pharisee, a lawyer, who tried to test him by asking which was the greatest of all the commandments. 
our Lord gave the definitive answer. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and with thy whole soul and with thy whole mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And the second is like to this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. St. Thomas Aquinas said that this commandment, loving God with your whole mind, heart, strength, will only be perfectly fulfilled by those that are in heaven, with one exception, the Blessed Virgin. Only she was able to fulfill this commandment perfectly because only she had completely emptied herself of all self. She who was perfectly humble was able to be perfectly full of the love of God. We have to be careful here that we don't misunderstand the meaning of the word full. We think, of course, of something that is full as full up to the top, that it can't receive more, perhaps. And, of course, Mary was full of grace. She had as much love of God as she was capable. But we need to be careful that we don't make the mistake of thinking she was not able to love him more. He was not able to pour more grace into her soul because God, the creator of all things, if he so wills, can make something larger, can he not? From the moment of our Blessed Mother's conception, she was full of grace. She loved God with all of her capacity. But St. Alphonsus explains that it was God's will that at every moment the Creator increased that capacity and that this increase was exponential. Exponential, meaning at every moment Mary's pure love gained for her the ability to love God twice as much. And this is from the moment of her conception. Can we imagine how great her capacity for love would be then if our capacity is maybe one cup? Our Blessed Mother's ability for love would be as all of the oceans, seas, lakes, rivers in the entire world combined. And this is a shallow comparison. But we might ask, if every fiber of her being was consumed with the love of God, which it was, how is it that she's also able to love us? Is this not dividing her interests? Our Lord explained the answer one day to St. Catherine of Genoa. She was complaining to him. He had appeared to her. And she said, Lord, thou willest that I should love my neighbor, but I can love none but thee. He answered very simply, all who love me love what I love. Since no one ever loved God with as much love as our Blessed Mother loved him. So no one ever loved mankind as much as Mary. There's hardly any of the stories in Scripture which so wonderfully show her loving care for us as the story of the wedding feast of Cana. It shows that solicitous care that a mother has. The little details that a mother sees to make everything run smoothly. And this wonderful diligence, of course, has as its source charity. 
A mother can't stand to see a day's plans ruined. To see her children disappointed. She will do everything in her power to make sure that nothing is overlooked. So that everything goes well. We have to know that our blessed mother outdoes the most diligent and thoughtful of mothers a thousand times over. We remember well the story of the wedding feast at Cana. Here our Lord and his mother and his disciples were invited to this wedding feast. And as the festivities went on, the sharp eye of Mary saw that they were running out of wine. She addressed this to her son. What is it to me and to thee, woman? My hour has not yet come. And then those quiet, meaningful words mean so very much. She turns to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. She knew exactly what he was going to do. So perfect was the union between mother and son. But this little story shows us so clearly that she is aware of our every need. There is not the smallest of our petitions that she does not know about. And that she will bring to her son. She will find a solution if... It is truly for our own good. Our Blessed Mother shows her immense love for God, her charity toward God, most especially by a feverish activity, by a constant doing of good for mankind. She so often is stooping to help us, showering us with graces, so often appearing to help us, poor sinners, by loving us as herself, for God's sake. Now, having spoken of charity, the greatest of all the virtues, we have the other theological virtues to, to consider. St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 13, Now there remain these three, faith, hope, and charity, As the bishop so brilliantly pointed out to us yesterday, Mary is the new Eve. Tertullian among the fathers proclaimed that by disbelieving, by doubt in God, Eve brought about our fall. And so Mary, by her trust, by her faith, was the beginning of our redemption. Here I have to quote, Suarez was quoted by St. Alphonsus in the Glories of Mary. The most holy virgin had more faith than all men and angels. She saw her son in the crib of Bethlehem and believed him the creator of the world. She saw him fly from Herod and yet believed him the king of kings. She saw him born and believed him eternal. She saw him poor and in need of food, and believed him Lord of the universe. She saw him lying on straw, and believed him omnipotent. She observed that he did not speak, and yet she believed him infinite wisdom. She heard him weep, and believed him the joy of paradise. Finally, she saw him in death, despised and crucified, And although faith wavered in others, she remained firm. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, Mary, his mother. I'm sure that we have all been inspired at some point by a person of great faith. In my own life, I've had this blessing and 
I hope I don't get in too much trouble for telling this story. But um, I, have a, I think I mentioned it to the parishioners of St. Cloud, Minnesota. When I was a seminarian, a, a, a brother, and was in charge of the cooking for the seminary, the, the boarders, and the staff of Mater Dei, the bishop one day called me to his office. And he asked me, brother, do we have a lot of food in the freezers? Uh, Your Excellency, not particularly. Okay, uh, how long do you think you can make it stretch? I'm not sure. Uh, I'll try. Like, okay, well, here's the thing. We are out of money. We don't even have the ability to get groceries this month, so do whatever you can. Make it stretch. And he mentioned just very casually, very briefly, yeah, I've been looking online this morning to see how much I could pawn my Episcopal ring ring for. So, So my immediate response was to panic. Oh my goodness, this is, this is, this is horrific. What can we do? This is unthinkable. But it's something that has stuck to me even to this day. My reaction was, was panic. Uh, Well, you know, okay, how, how can we fix this? But the bishop was calm. He simply said, it's okay. God will provide. That was a very, very powerful example of faith. In the seminary, St. Joseph's Minor Seminary, we're reading the life of St. Gerard Magella. To Heaven Through a Window is the title of the book. And the faith of this humble lay brother is astounding. Our Lord said, if you have Faith the size of a mustard seed. You can move mountains. I don't remember reading that St. Gerard actually moved mountains, but he did move a forest one time. I don't remember the exact details, but they needed to build a church or or add on to the church, but there were all these trees in the way. And he said, oh, don't worry. And he went and he grabbed a tree, and the tree moved. Moved while staying alive. And he, do, he told the workers, oh, just do as I do. Just do as I do. They dragged the trees to a nice spot where they lived for many years. Faith like this is, is incomprehensible. But here is what we must understand. Faith like this is like a candle in front of the sun when compared with our Blessed Mother's faith. Her faith outshines all the faith of mankind for all of history. We can hardly comprehend how perfect is our Blessed Mother's faith. The virtue of hope is very much like the virtue of faith. Because hope, after all, is believing that God is going to provide everything that we need. Very soon, the beautiful season of Advent will be upon us, and the, the theme, the atmosphere of this season is hope. They are awaiting the coming of the Messiah, what hope there is in salvation. We hear the plaintive yearning of, of a whole people, Veni, veni, Emmanuel, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Free thy captive, Israel. Our Lady knew scripture. She knew what this would mean, the coming of the Messiah. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. By this and by other prophecies, she knew the Messiah would be God himself. And how she waited She whose everything was Almighty God. And he would come and visit his people? How could she wait? 
How Mary longed and hoped for that day. And God, of course, did not leave this hope unrewarded. The latter part of our Blessed Mother's life on earth is particularly consoling to think, to think of as regards hope. After Jesus' death, she again knew the scriptures. Her heart was buried in the tomb with her son. But nevertheless, there was that quiet hope which came from a firm faith that he never could tell a lie. He told his apostles, after three days, I will rise again. With what hope did our Blessed Mother hope? After our Lord's ascension, how fervent were her hopes for the newly adopt, her newly adopted children, for the young church. And how she hoped and longed for that day when her son would bring her back to him. So next we must quickly consider the evangelical councils. Those three councils that are so very dear to all religious Poverty, chastity, and obedience. How did our Blessed Mother practice poverty, chastity, and and obedience? Matthew 19, 21. If thou wilt be perfect, go sell what thou hast and give to the poor, and come and follow me. Our Lady revealed one day to St. Bridget, from the beginning I vowed in my own heart that I would never possess anything on earth. There was a beautiful thought recounted by St. Alphonsus that came from St. Bernard concerning the gifts of the Magi at Epiphany. Certainly these were very costly gifts. And by the inspiration, by the help of the Holy Ghost, St. Bernard tells us, the Blessed Mother took these gifts immediately. She gave them to St. Joseph and pleaded that he go sell them and give their entire value to the poor. To the poor of that city of Bethlehem, that's where they had been rejected, where they were now staying in a stable because the people would not have them. But our Blessed Mother has always the poor in mind. St. Bonaventure gives us even more food for thought. He says that we have to think of the very simple fact that they were poor. St. Joseph was a humble carpenter. This means that our blessed lady would have worked to help support that little family. That she who was fair as the moon, bright as the sun, terrible as an army set in battle array, sat in the little home in Nazareth, spinning or sewing, doing some menial labor with her hands so that they didn't go hungry. Why did Our Lady love poverty so much? St. Philip Neri would say, he who loves the things of the world will never become a saint. And our Lord A man cannot have two masters. Our mother would not keep from her God even a tiny portion, a little corner of her heart. She had to give everything. When speaking of our Blessed Mother's purity, we could go on and on. But some spiritual writers talk about the strangeness of Our Lady's virginity. Truly, her perfect chastity is like a lighthouse. If we keep our eyes on this light, we will save ourselves from shipwreck. But why do some spiritual writers say this is strange or rather unique? When we were speaking about hope, about Advent, the coming of the Messiah, 
It was considered a truly unfortunate, even an evil omen. If a woman in the Old Testament did not bear children, because every young maiden wanted the chance to be the mother of the Messiah. But our Blessed Mother was the first to consecrate her virginity to Almighty God. She gave up, as it were, this incredible chance. But we know the outcome. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. This is truly a precious virtue to Almighty God. We have only to look at his own life. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. We know which of his disciples was the most beloved, St. John. St. John, who was chaste, was pure, was given the opportunity to rest on our Lord's breast at the Last Supper. Our Lord chose to be born of a virgin, to have as his foster father the chaste Saint Joseph. And of course, Mary was entirely without spot, all pure, all chaste. The church extols this virtue of purity in our, our Blessed Mother very much. We always say the Blessed Virgin Mary. She is Virgin of Virgins. Mary, Immaculate Queen. Always this use of the word virgin because this is such a struggle for poor mankind. Mary is our guiding star. Again, that lighthouse that can save us from shipwreck if we look to her. So much has already been said about Mary's obedience because Obedience and humility go hand in hand. Blessed is the womb that bore thee and the breast that nursed thee. We considered this again yesterday. Our Lord responded to the woman. Yea, rather, blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Yes, he says, this is not a correction. This is a reinforcement. He is agreeing. Yea, yes. She is. But she is even more blessed because she has heard the word of God. She has heard every one of his words and she has kept them. She has been obedient in every way to her God. There are so many Examples of our Blessed Mother's obedience. My soul magnifies the Lord. What hum- humility in these words. We know that she acquiesced to the angel Gabriel's announcement with perfect obedience and humility. How shall this be done, since I know not man? It will be done, Lord, but you must help me. I I don't understand yet. What perfect blind obedience. Our Blessed Mother loves obedience in her children so much. This is a hallmark of the children of Mary, that we submit ourselves. We become like putty in her hands so that she can form us. We obey her every desire. We are obedient. The rest of the virtues of our Blessed Mother. We have patience and prayer. We know that of all the crosses that we have to carry in this life... When dealing with our human nature, patience, impatience rather, is a heavy cross. It comes up so unwanted. We have this anger that wells up, this emotion, this passion in us. And we find ourselves tempted towards impatience so very easily. But if we know our Blessed Mother's patience, 
I think that we'll do better. Patient, impatience always comes from having to suffer something of some kind. How little, how insignificant are our sufferings so very often? Our blessed mother suffered, and did she suffer? Her seven sorrows, the flight into Egypt, the losing of the child Jesus in the temple, the climax of her suffering, standing beneath the cross, these intense sufferings, and yet she never uttered a word. She was patient till the end. The last of the virtues that we will consider is prayer. And prayer in our Blessed Mother is almost like the ribbon that ties together all of her virtues that she can present this magnificent bouquet to our Blessed Lord. Because our Blessed Mother's prayer was always Every single thing she did was a prayer. We don't read of extraordinary occurrences. We don't even hear of them in private revelation of our Blessed Mother being caught up in ecstasies or raptures. There was a a simplicity. St. Therese of of the Child Jesus may remind us of this simplicity. That everything she did was a prayer. Every joy, every suffering, every practicing of virtue was a prayer so that all of these things could ascend to the throne of Almighty God like incense. My dear friends in Christ, in conclusion, we can know our mother. We've touched on just these basic virtues very briefly. If we want to, we can know her. Now we know that our one love is Jesus Christ. He is the center of our world, our everything, and our one goal is to know him, to imitate him. If we are seeking Christ, we can be certain that he is with his mother. St. Louis de Montfort explains so clearly and logically that God wills that we come to him through his mother. She is the advocate with Christ, as Christ is the advocate with our Father. If our Blessed Mother asks, it will not be refused. Her divine Son can refuse her nothing. Let us go to her. We have to remember If we know her, we can imitate her. Let us think of what her interests are. The interests of Mary, the interests of God are interchangeable. They are one and the same. Those that love God. Remember what our Lord said to St. Catherine of Genoa. Those that love me love what I love. Those that love God, love what God loves. Those that love Mary, love what God loves. My dear friends, let us pray every day. When we kneel down, we tell our Lord what our intentions are for this day. Let us never let a day pass where we do not call on our Blessed Mother Mary, help me to know myself. That I can despise what is in me that does not belong to God. Let me detach myself from the world and the devil and the snares that they set for me. Dear Mary, please help me to know you better. So that through you, I might come to your Son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.